hear of crazy Joe Gallo? Well at my dad's shop when I was a kid he was just a bookie and I saw him almost beat a man to death with that chair right there. You know and that's the kind of you know it was that blood and guts and that, that shop was actually known to be the bloodiest tattoo shop in the Bowery. There was blood splattered on the flash that it was stained there, you know what I mean? So those were the kind of characters that, that were the ones before me. They were real unique characters, you know? So those little guys didn't make a living out of tattooing. They all had full-time jobs. Pop Eddie was born and raised in San Francisco and raised six children, and could you imagine raising a family of six kids and riding a goddamn bus all the time? I mean, that was... It wouldn't happen today, you know, but um, they always dressed properly. Most guys wore hats, suits, ties. Now everybody looks like a goddamn buffalo skinner. When I started, uh, you know, tattooing, and and and, and in that era, you know, there was no tattoos on TV. It was, you know, it, that's why I say it was more of an almost an underground kind of thing. I mean, it was legal, but there were many places. Uh, many more places then it was not legal. It was very secretive in, in, in the old days and people didn't want to um, tell you anything. Some uh, people you worked for, they wouldn't give you the address of the supplier because uh, you know they, they feared that you know if you got this knowledge then you'd get your own stuff and then you'd open up down the street. And of course little did they know you know how it is these days. I mean there's, it's, it's almost like there's a tattoo shop on every corner and it was never supposed to be like that. I mean, like, it was, it was more like an, I don't know, an underground thing almost back in the day, an, an outlaw thing, a, a blue collar thing, you know. Ed Hardy was doing Japanese, Sailor Jerry was doing Japanese, Zeke was doing Japanese. Some other people, like um, Cliff was interested in Japanese, uh, Don Nolan was interested and Tommy Yeoman were interested in Japanese, but we were sharing as much as we could with each other about what we were finding and about, you know, what books to buy and what these animals meant and, you know, all of, and it was just, it was so heady and we were mad about each other. We were crazy about tattooing. We are crazy about this new field of kuniyoshi in Japanese. Also, this is in New York City. Everything was illegal. You had to know where to go. You had to have, you know, kind of an inn to get in. It was like a speakeasy kind of situation. Women and civilians didn't get tattooed at this time. I mean, seriously, it was for sailors and for sort of sociopaths. I never saw a tattoo shop till I think it was 1976 uh, in Cincinnati, and this little shop opened up in a barber shop and had a few dragons painted over the plywood over the glass to keep the glass from being broken. It was down by a honky tonk down there that ser served uh, beer in uh, mason jars and bluegrass music. Arcades. You had Market Street, you had arcades, you had a few, any of an arcade is, like I said, it had, generally had the shooting gallery in it, it might have pinball machines in it. Up in front, it's got a hot dog stand in the center, it's got a slum jewelry counter on one side, which is sort of the office too. On the other side, shoe shining. Then you go back in there, some of them had a mug joint, which is a photographic joint with a couple young trollops, with big bazooms or whatever, but outgoing young ladies. You had all the gypsies, you had all the prostitutes, you had all the cops, you had the Filipino cockfighters, you had the jazz musicians, you had the topless dancers, you had, you know, um, all of this mix of incredible, colorful characters all over Hotel Street. and the. Air smelled like teriyaki sauce and coconuts, and it was it was amazing. The uh, tattoo stand was uh, sort of a wooden platform, a couple of steps up, and you had this wooden platform, and uh, there was no running water. 
there were no toilet facilities or wash basin or anything else. So you went to the spigot and filled the bucket and you rinsed your tattoo machine in the bucket and you had a sponge and you wiped off the Vaseline and the ink and the blood that was coming on the arm and rinsed out the sponge in the bucket. At the end of the evening, uh, and sometimes, you know, you, you kept open until the place, uh, until there were no more customers. So sometimes it was one o'clock in the morning, sometimes it was two o'clock in the morning. You then took your bucket and you poured out what now was tar. <laughs> it was pitch black. <laughs> Okay, a soup of blood, inks, Vaseline, uh, whatever, hairs that had been shaved off. I mean, you, you shaved them. And of course, the razor also was rinsed in the bucket. And there were always some hairs sticking to the razor. So it was a horrible mess. But um, that's the way the business was done in those days. Just to go and visit those shops, they were very guarded. You know, you had to, you couldn't go in there and ask questions. You'd get your ass thrown right out. Tattooing wasn't that popular, so there wasn't that much tattooing going on. So if you went in and told somebody you wanted to be a tattoo artist, what you were doing was flat-footedly standing there telling the man that you wanted to be his competition. When it's illegal, obviously, you can't advertise and you can't put your name in the phone book. So I drew up some business cards. The shop was named Catfish Tattoo Studio. And Michael would take a fistful of these during the day and just walk the streets of New York. And when he saw somebody who had a visible tattoo, and that was very rare to see anybody who had any ink showing at all. If he'd see just a glimmer of a little tattoo, he'd go up and hand them a card. And then after six o'clock, people would call, we'd give them the address, they'd come over. To me, tattooing is like living in a living art gallery. Unfortunately, a lot of this history from tattooing from way back is going to be lost as more and more people die. I was I mentioned to somebody recently, need to get a convention to where late at night when everybody's sitting around the bar and they're telling their stories, you remember 25, 30 years ago this or that, somebody needs to be writing that down or recording it because as that person dies, those stories are gone. Z-Cat supposedly had this monkey and one day, um, I don't know what happened to Zeke. He left the monkey, or the monkey got out of his cage, and the monkey was like running around the shop and doing all kinds of weird stuff and took out all this tattoo ink and the bottles and was squirting it around. And, and um, he had all this red, the monkey had all this red ink like splattered everywhere. And Zeke, I don't know if the story is true or not, but um, there's a front counter. You know, and then you go through the gate and everything to go in the back and get tattooed. But I think Zeke was passed out. He said that Zeke was passed out. And all Danny could see were these feet and all this red that looked like blood. And he goes in there and he's like totally freaked out and thought, oh my God, he's been killed. And this monkey is like up on the rafters or up there, you know, going chee, 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 chee. And all this red ink is everywhere. And it's like, oh God. He was working with Philadelphia Eddie for two years, yeah. which he always had a clot over his leg. Uh, and he was wondering why he, was using, why he wasn't using inked. But what he was doing, he had six ink caps. I think it was red, green, yellow, was black, and shade. And he used to pick the ink caps up and he used to disappear under his clot. He used to piss in them and put them back straight down. Uh, come on, let's go. <laughs> Extending the ink. You used the needles until the customer started bleeding profusely. At that point, you looked at the needles and you saw that one of them was like a crochet needle. It was bent over. And that it was time, then it was time to change the needle bar. <laughs> okay. But you never changed needles until the needles gave out on you. I can still remember being scared to death. And I can still remember everyone in there was scared to death. There were no chairs. You came in, you got tattooed, you left. If you weren't getting tattooed, get the hell out. It's simple as that. And there was no hand-holding, and there was no let's check your aura, or what's your sign, or none of that. It's like, hey, buddy, you want a tattoo? And you'd pick something off the wall, and you sat down and got it. It wasn't like I just went in and I said, hey, man, I was, I was thinking like, you know, a heart with some wings and a dagger. And by the time they're done drawing it out, you know, it's, it's been a... Uh, 
you didn't you didn't want to tell him no. You didn't like it or you wanted a bigger, you know. I mean, here's all these guys sitting around, man. I'm like, you know, you don't know if you're gonna get tattooed or your ass kicked. The stories, you know, about shaving some of the a lot of guys carried uh, straight razors in their socks. I liked all that shit, rough and tumble stuff. You never went up to somebody and just said, you know, what colors do you use? You never do that, you know? You had to watch and listen. And then you would say, that's a seven mag you're using, isn't it? And you would load the question with the answer. And if it was right, you were allowed to stay a little bit longer. If it was wrong, that demoted you, you know. So I stood in the corner, I kept my mouth shut, and I watched for three weeks. Bob Roberts, well, I heard a story which has been repeated to me a few times that he was held up by machine gun um, and he left. Um, <laughs> he left the city. Uh, Tony Polito uh, was also held up in uh, Leffert's. Uh, Boulevard in, in uh, Brooklyn, uh, Crown Heights, Brooklyn. And, um, you know, it was a very scary thing. Someone told me that they actually shotgunned, killed yeah. uh, his front man. I mean, uh, you know, uh, and, he's, and he's continued to tattoo. And supposedly he had a thick plexiglass uh, cage around him uh, where you'd stick your arm in to get the tattoo. I mean, it seems so extreme. But I mean, do what you got to do. Yeah, one of Dean's early shops was in a, a meat locker on Broadway. The store had not been a meat locker for decades. And we actually tattooed inside the freezer, uh, which was about uh, a foot and a half thick uh, because it was insulated with cork. The shops were so crowded that you stood in line to get tattooed. So you had a lot of time to stare at all the stuff on the walls while you stood in line. This was 65, so everything was left over from the Second World War. And they'd just kind of been jazzed up a little bit, maybe with a little bit more color. But, you know, the images that were on the wall during early Vietnam were those same images that were on the wall in Second World War and even Korean War. The hippie kind of images haven't, hadn't come yet. So I just picked all those classic sailor tattoos. <laughs> they look good. You know what I'm saying? The square knot, the eagle, the sailor girl. And it was more about... Uh, not necessarily some big meaning behind it. They were just attractive images that seemed appropriate for a sailor to get. And I really kind of wanted all that, that old historical stuff that kind of had been done, you know what I mean? That stuff just looked good to me. Long story, but we'll make it short. Friend of mine that I used to ride motorcycle with, he belonged to an outlaw motorcycle club. Named, uh, his name was Ralph. Was after me for years uh, to learn to tattoo. He wanted to get tattooed by me. He came to the house one day uh, and he told me, he said, listen, I know this guy, Ronnie. He runs a tattoo shop. His kid is stealing from him. And he needs somebody that's honest and artistic to watch the shop and try and keep the kid from stealing too much money. And I looked at Ralph, I laughed at him and said, ah, you're fucking crazy, go away. And he pulled out a gun, stuck it in my face, and he said, no, this time I'm really, really serious, you're going with me. Then he took me down to Ronnie's tattoo shop and he introduced me to Ronnie. Ronnie and I hit it off, became very good friends, and I learned to tattoo in the process. You, you can't learn from, from people today like you can learn from these, these, these guys that have been in the business. And if you take time to shut your mouth, and, and me, I love to talk, but you know, when you're with them, if you, if you, can, if you listen to what they say, you can, you just, there's so much knowledge. I mean, just listen to their stories, you know, about, I always say to new guys, man, you really missed out on the fun of this business because there was conventions, man. The first time I went to a Pittsburgh show, uh, you know, I walk in, there's some dude passed out in an elevator, someone's urinating on him, you know, and it was just wild, crazy, man. I mean, it was bikers and it was, it was, it was a blast, you know. I mean, you come into shops down around Fort Benning, Georgia, and, you know, I used to work in a couple down there, and, and it was just, you know, it was, it was all bikes, it was parties, man. Uh, a guy, uh, I worked with Falcon, walked out of the shop one day, got shot six times in the chest, he was nailing someone's old lady, and uh, never turned a dude in, he lived, you know, missed his heart and his, his spine, but, uh, that's the way it was, man. And it was, if you open up on someone, you, you got to beat that. I mean, he sit around and talk to Dr. Don and how he kept the shop in Las Vegas for so long without anyone opening up on him. And these guys tell you that. And, and I missed that part of it. Uh, frankly, I, I liked the renegade aspect of tattooing. 
and I think a lot of artists and a lot of collectors want to make tattooing as uh, acceptable um, throughout the world and make it as uh, acceptable. You can buy it in Target, and now their 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 dream has come true, and look where it's gotten us. Uh, I, I've learned in my uh, background in advertising and background, uh, even in marketing in college and that sort of thing, the fastest way to kill anything is make it part of pop culture. And uh, that's, what, that's my biggest fear of tattooing. The greatest words that you can hear when you're getting tattooed is when the tattoo artist says, you're done. I'm glad that's a, it's the world's dumbest goddamn hobby. Sit down and let some bastard sting you to death. They get stung all over, you know.